Arousal is a physiological and psychological state involving the activation of the reticular activating system in the brainstem, the autonomic nervous system, and the endocrine system. Changes in arousal affect the activity of the sympathetic nervous system, one of the two subsystems of the autonomic nervous system, which can be monitored by psychophysiological parameters such as skin conductivity and heart rate. Gerard found that exposure to red light increased arousal reflected by augmented systolic blood pressure, skin conductance, respiration rate, eye blink frequency, cortical activation, and subjective evaluations as compared to blue light. Wilson, in 1966, reported a different influence of red and green light on skin conductance, with red light being more arousing than green light. In addition, Ali found more cortical activity after exposure to red light compared to blue light. Based on these findings, it was claimed that red light has the capacity to arouse and activate people, while blue and green light possess qualities that can calm individuals. <clears throat> Yodo found that blue color elicited a higher arousal compared to red as expressed by lower EEG alpha and theta activity. Remarkably, in contrast with this psychophysiological effect, the participants rated red to be more arousing than blue, because red color was also found to be more strongly active in the areas of perception and attention of the central cortical region in this study. The researchers suggested that blue is biologically activating, while red possibly elicits anxiety, as the color red is frequently used as a warning sign in dangerous situations. For example, red, red traffic, red stop, stop signs, code red, red in alerting systems, red, red fire brigade traps. We have learned to pay particular attention to the color red. This idea is supported by the observations of Gerard that red light evoked a variety of unpleasant associations related to blood, injuries, fire, and danger, while blue light was associated with positive thoughts such as friendliness, romantic love, and blue skies. Thus, increased arousal not necessarily means that one feels positively energized or active, but can instead be an indication of feelings of anger, fear, or discomfort. As a consequence, not only arousal, but valence, the intrinsic attractiveness, positive valence, or aversiveness, negative valence, of a color should be taken into account when investigating the way a particular color affects people. What you see is determined by what you attend to. At any given time, the environment presents far more perceptual information than can effectively be processed. Visual attention allows people to select the information that is most relevant to ongoing behavior. The study of visual attention is relevant to any situation in which actions are based on visual information from the environment. Active attentional selection occurs over space and time. Spatial selection studies typically have subjects focus attention on a subject of the spatial array, allowing for selective report of information at the focus of attention. The spotlight has been a favorite metaphor for spatial attention because it captures some of the introspective phenomenology of attention. The feeling that attention can be deployed, like a beam of mental light, to reveal what was hidden in the world. One wonders if this feeling was the starting point for ancient extramission theories of vision in which vision was thought to require visual rays emitted from the eyes. Suppose I say, on a dark night, I heard a mallard drake over there. It is obvious that my claim goes far beyond my evidence. All that I heard was a couple of faint quacking sounds. I took it for granted that these emanated from a bird with a bottle green head, yellow beak, curly tail feathers, etc. I know from experience that such sounds usually originate from such a bird, but also that some people can imitate them. The problem of visual space perception is how an observer, human or otherwise, can perceive a three-dimensional spatial layout of environmental surfaces using only the light that is reflected from these surfaces to the eyes of the observer. A solution is possible because this reflected light, called the optic array, has been structured by its interaction with the environment. Different environments produce different optic arrays, so that the particular structure of each optic array reaching the observer is in some way specific to the environment that produced it. This makes it possible within some limitations to work backwards from the structure in the optic array to recover the structure of the environment. 
process called inverse projection. When such inverse projection is possible, the optical rays that will carry visual information will specify the environment. Often, for example, I hear a bark without having seen or touched or smelled a barker. My auditory sense data cannot even be explained as being caused by my other sense data. Arguments such as the following will be developed. One, visual and tactile sense data are ordered in four dimensions. Three of these dimensions are spatial and one temporal. Therefore, their unobservable causes must be similarly ordered. Specialized sense organs on the tongue and soft palate contain the receptors for our sense of taste. Taste receptor cells are clustered in a layered ball called the taste bud. These cells are modified skin cells rather than neurons and have a lifespan of about a week. New cells differentiate from the surrounding epithelium, migrate into the taste bud, and make synaptic contact with the nerves. nerves. A pore at the top of the taste bud makes contact with the fluid environment in the mouth. Taste molecules are going to combine with oil like cereal that project from the top of the taste cells and they're opening the water. Some of the taste cells in each bud make contact with the primary taste nerve that are just enough to connect them. Packets of nerve transmitter molecules are released from the gap that knows the primary atoms in 